All right. Hello, good people. Uh, for those coming in, the front row is all free. Uh, I, I spit only a little. <laughs> and I don't care if you play with your phone. So just come to the front. Do not hide. Uh, I, I don't care what you're doing. So I'm here to talk about last year, about my last year. Because last year, after wrapping up PyCon US, I took advantage of being at the West Coast, since I'm from Europe, so traveling to the West Coast is kind of a big deal, like it is to travel to Cape Town, actually. It's about the same time, plus jet lag. And I did the classic road trip that like everybody is doing there. I took a rental in San Francisco, went down to LA, up to Las Vegas, uh, and through the mountains back to San Francisco. And because that wasn't enough, I took a small little detour to Hawaii. Now, this tour plus PyCon took me more than five weeks. And with every new photo I tweeted, people kept me asking more and more, how, how do I do it? And if I still have a job. Now, as it turns out, I do still have a job. And in that job, I'm responsible for almost 70 projects. It might be even 70 by now. Um, and it worked so well that I took it a step further this year. Because right now, I haven't been in Europe since August. Uh, so in the beginning of September, I took two weeks safari, a camping safari, which I've been completely off the grid. I just went through Zimbabwe, Botswana, and back to Joburg, and then flew in here. And I have to say that being in Musenberg is also kind of being off the grid. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've paid for a co-working place, <laughs> and the internet is incredible. <laughs> Anyhow, this is also the reason why I look, why, how I look like. Uh, I, had, I haven't had a haircut in a month. I have no access to a hairdryer. And I had no, sp no space in my luggage for fancy clothes. So you're get, getting surfer Hinnick here. Um, anyhow, it turns out that people find it interesting how to achieve, uh, achieve a true vacation, actually. So I'm here to tell my story, or more like the things I consider my most important and that fit into 45 minutes. And I'm going to touch on a lot of topics, ranging from DevOps to software engineering. So I hope there will be some, something for everyone. And as always in my talks, there will be a link at the end that has all the links, all the projects, and more material for you to study. So let's get going. Like every big change, if you want to change something, it starts with attitude. And in this case, you have to start to value quality. And the problem with quality is that it means that you spend a significant amount of time on non-features. And this brings us directly to incentives. Because I don't think any boss on earth would say that quality is not a priority. Right? Everything is top priority nowadays. But if you do not have enough time to write tests, to instrument your systems and things like that, you're kind of like a construction company that says that safety is number one priority, but the workers have to buy their own hard hats and safety gear. It's just a conflict here. And reliable systems do take time. And if your only performance metric is shipping new features fast, uh, just getting them rolling, <laughs> you have a conflict of interest here. Now, there is a little bit of hope, because this whole thing is not just about having you having a vacation, although it's also important even for the company. Uh, Well-rested programmers program better. But there's a solid business case. Because the fewer urgent interruptions you have in a workday, the more you get to work on important stuff. And it's quite frankly like that. If, you, if you're just building features, 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 you will accumulate a certain number of unreliable systems. And there is a breaking point. And this, uh, from this breaking point on, you don't get anything done more because you just keep uh, firefighting all day and you <clears throat> there's no movement anymore. Now, the problem with that is that it takes long-term thinking, which is not super common in our line of work. Um, sometimes you just don't have the time. If you work for a startup and it's running out of money, so you have to build something really quick, that's a problem. That's not something I can figure out for you, sadly. So um, let's get a bit more practical. And for the first part, I'm going to defer to authority. In this case, um, Tony Hoare, who invented QuickSort, and who's just generally very accomplished in all things concurrent systems. And so he said that the price of reliability is the pursuit of utmost simplicity. 
Now, if you prefer a Dutch Sage, which at a Python conference is understandable, Dijkstra say basically the same. Now, it's important to not conflate simple and easy, and there's a great talk about that uh, from the inventor of Clojure, because easy solutions are solutions that you build from things you already know, but they are rarely simple. They're just near to your problem domain. And simple solutions that will serve you well in the long term, they are usually not easy to find. They take a lot of thinking. They, they need you to understand the problem domain properly before you build your abstractions. Now, a good way to approach simplicity is looking at the other side, on complexity. And in our case, I find it helpful to um, define it as the number of concepts and things you have to keep in mind when you're trying to reason about the behavior of a thing or about what a change to a system will, will make happen. How many things do you have to juggle in your mind? And humans are naturally limited in things they can juggle, both literally and figuratively. And if you have to juggle too many things, you start dropping balls, you start dropping thoughts. And once that happens, it leads to normal accidents. And this term has been coined by Charles Perrow in the wake of the Three Mile Island incident, which was, uh, let's say, minor nuclear accident in the United States. And they're called normal because they're inevitable in an extremely complex and uh, tightly coupled system. So they will happen. And if you're going to return to software, um, imagine your program is such a contraption. And I'm sure everyone who has been writing software for a while has something like this in production, and probably the, bus the company will go out of business if it fails. Now, it's impossible to reason about what happens if you play with this knob, because there are too many parts connected to it, and it gets even worse. Try to reason what happens if one of the parts break. It's impossible, although it's easy. The whole thing will just come crashing down, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, the irony here is that if you have something like this and try to make it more reliable, you're adding more complexity. And by adding more complexity, you are making it more likely to fail. Okay? So once you arrive there, there's only one realistic option, and it's rewriting from scratch. Now, when we talk about complexity, it's important to distinguish the two types, the two essential types. Like the, uh, the essential complexity, which is inherent to the problem you are solving. So that is what your boss has told you, or the customer, what the cus it's the value you are uh, generating, like uh, playing cat videos. But there's also accidental complexity. And it's complexity that you incur yourself, that you're doing to yourself. And accidental complexity comes from wrong abstractions, uh, cumbersome deployment procedures, or let's say using ancient and completely in inadequate uh, tools like Python 2, for example. This is, by the way, some uh, Python 2 code I found in Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> it's so old, nobody knows when it was exactly written, but... <laughs> All right. So there's... There's always going to be some accidental complexity. We are humans, and th there are constraints that are put on us. But you have always to keep the focus on the essential complexity you are supposed to solve. And ask yourself, did I just spend a week on solving accidental problems, or did I do something that creates value? So now, what is simple software? Simple software is a talk by itself, or more like um, it's a conference by itself. I could be talking for hours about that. But I personally kind of like the ravioli uh, metaphor, which is uh, comically used for both to describe what you want and also as to describe an anti-pattern when you're taking it too far. But I'm going to use the positive spin on it. So we've said that normal accidents happen in tightly coupled complex systems. So it follows that you should prefer simple objects that are self-contained and it have simple relationships with each other, which is ravioli. They are small, they are self-contained, unless you overcook them, and you should not overcook them. Italians get really angry. You've seen one, uh, one of them this morning. They take pasta very personally. And um, so they should just do as little as possible and know as little as possible about other objects. And I think, find it's even the more important part. 
because you want to have clear interfaces and you want to have as little assumptions about each other as possible. And many, 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 um, let's say, mentors on uh, object-oriented design have said this before, dependencies will kill you. And this does not mean things that you install from PyPI. PyPI is working great nowadays. Um, that means that dependencies between your objects, if, they get, if you get too many of them, if it gets too complex, it will just collapse under, under, under itself. And maybe you should see the object graph some, somehow like a family tree. It's really bad if you have a loop in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you follow this, you have one big upside. You get objects that are very easy to test, and that's, that's great because you have a few dependencies and it's clear what you put inside. You know what you have to fake, you, have to, you know what you have to mock. Now, badge design, and I'm staying in pasta land. Um, big classes, also known as god objects. God objects because they know too much, they do too much, and they are super hard to test because you have to spin up this whole uh, world of dependencies to even instantiate one of them. And a sad thing is that uh, they are very common in, Python, in the Python world, which one of the reasons I've identified is that it's kind of tedious to write classes in Python, but more on that uh, later. Now, another mostly self-inflicted complexity uh, is basing your design on subclassing. And I've been known that I'm not a big fan of subclassing, but I'm not gonna preach here. I'm, I'm not gonna say that it's bad per se, but it is used in the wrong way. So subclassing has been invented by its inventors for specialization, not for code sharing. And that's exactly what most people are using for. And there's a bunch of rules around subclassing, like Liskov substitution principle, open close principle, all those. And if everyone followed them, we would have no regrets. But uh, we, we do have them, and um, subclassing makes your classes or your code always more complex. It's easier because you have to write less code, but it's harder to understand because you end up with namespace confusion because where is this attribute coming from? Am I allowed to call my attribute like that or will it break some other class because it's using the same name? Then the MRO. I mean, there are so many questions about the MRO on Stack Overflow. It's almost like exiting Vim. And <laughs> it's true. <laughs> And you get scattered logic, and it's worse than uh, scattered logic as in functions, where you just call a function, you know, okay, I have to look here. No, you're calling some method, and then you have to traverse your whole hierarchy to find out which method is actually called, where is it coming from. So, there's of co course, everything's about trade-offs, and it may be completely worth it to use subclassing in your code, but it shouldn't be where you start. It's, it should be something that emerges over time for practical reasons. So don't start projects with coming up with hierarchies. Try to find good uh, abstractions instead. And this is not some kind of hipster thing or so. If you look at all the modern languages that came out recently, Go or Rust, they're doing, doing just fine without having any kind of subclassing. And I'm going to be as bold as to say that Apple added subclassing to Swift only because they needed it to interoperate with Objective-C. Because all their APIs that have been developed recently are based on delegation. Now, relatedly, meta classes, very powerful, very overused. And they're kind of Python monads, because nobody understands them. And then people read something, and then they understand, and they write a blog post about how simple uh, meta classes are and how awesome they are. But in the end, you're again paying complexity for syntactic sugar. So I would suggest to leave them to David Beasley, and he's, he's just going to do something nice and depraved in his evil lair, or in some evil keynote. So I've mentioned that writing classes is tedious in Python, which is why I wrote adders. How many of you know about adders? OK. So those of you who are not, so adders will write class boilerplate for you, Dunder init, Dunder CMP, and all of those. And those who have not heard about it are probably restless in your seats, dying to tell me about name tuples. Turns out I know about name tuples. And uh, name tuples are also such a thing, someone finds them in the documentation and get really excited about all the code they don't have to write anymore. It's the best thing since sliced bread. 
um, that's not a high bar. Carbs, carbs are really bad for you. Um, but the problem is, um, name tuples are tuples with names, and they are good for that. But they are terrible as class replacement. So, for example, you have always the tuple type in your class tree, which has a lot of consequences many people do not realize. So the most straightforward one is, okay, your classes are always immutable, which some people like. But you get very, very, very odd rules about equality, because when you compare name tuples, the type of the tuple is ignored. Uh, they are iterable, so you can accidentally get the length, you can iterate them, um, you can unpack them, and this all shadows subtle bugs, and you're just surprised what's going on there. And you want to add a method to your class? Well, you, you're going to have to subclass your newly created name tuple, and then you have the, um, your MRO is polluted with the same object name twice. So all this, oh, um, if you want to influence your in Dunder init, you cannot. You have to uh, write a Dunder new, which has a lot of intricacies. It's not great. And uh, name tuples are really have been made by the standard library to return tuples and add names to them so they're easier to use. They were never really thought as a replacement for classes. Anyhow, Etters gives you a simple class. You cannot even tell it's uh, not handwritten. It will write the op optimal code once, so there is no performance penalty. And it has things like validators, converters, default values, including uh, factories. And this is, I, there's a very exciting future. We have a lot of great fe uh, features coming on. So now you may be asking, Hinnick, is this a serious project? Should I put this into production? And I'm so glad you asked. Yes, I have stickers. I do not have many, so if you want one, get it soon. This is kind of uh, stuff I found in my pockets after PyCon because I forgot to give them out. So, moving on. Operational complexity, which is the complexity of running your infrastructure or parts of it. Now, I don't think it's controversial to say that distributed systems are kind of hard. So, I just want to take this as an opportunity to look at a very simple distributed system, which I would call almost a best practice. It's, this is kind of standard. You have a client, the client talks to a CDN, which is not part of your own uh, DC. You have an application, the application has a work queue, maybe Celery, a database, maybe Postgres, and a Redis cache. Wonderful. Now, each of those red boxes now are a point of failure, which can take down your application. But wait, there's more. Every link between them too. So at this point, you have 10 independent points of failure. And if you know something about probabilities, and I know there's quite a bit of data scientists here, to, scientists here, so you probably do. You know that's not a good thing. So, and the problem is, of course, that network partitions are a thing. And many live in denial about this until it happens to them. And it will hit you too, eventually. This is like, it hit me, and I kind of lived in denial too. It's not just Google who runs into this. Um, so, you should really think twice before adding new boxes and new links to your infrastructure because they all add new exciting ways to fail. With that in mind, let's think about microservices, which is about splitting your application up into many small web services, which means you have many more red boxes and many more red links, arrows, which means that you go from a monolith, which has all the annoying things we like to hate about monoliths, um, to a highly distributed system. It's quite possible that you are not equipped to deal with that well. I'm not saying it's impossible, but doing this step can be quite painful. Uh, you don't really need new chairs. Everything is free in the front. <laughs> so, anyhow, so you, you end up with a lot of new, new decisions. Like, are you going with a tangled mess? And this is so tangled and so messy that I was too lazy to do this myself, so I took this slide from Andrew Godwin. Um, or are you going for a message bus? What message bus? This, uh, these are all questions you didn't have before, and you have new problems. Service discovery, which one do you take? etcd, console, aggregate logging. You need your lo to access your log, and just SSHing it your, into your machines is not going to cut it anymore, so I guess call Honza. Um, tracing. Do not even think about having a complex system like this without a tracing facilities, because then it's impossible to, uh, to debug anything. And all the other fallacies of uh, distributed computing that we just like to ignore until they bite us. 
Now, what you really want and what you really need are boundaries. You need to define and adhere uh, to boundaries between your modules and your packages. And you do not really need a network between your classes to enforce boundaries. That's up to you. And then you can have separate teams working on separate parts just as well if you have clear interfaces. Now, once you've established boundaries within your application, it's also very easy to migrate that architecture to microservices because the boundaries are there. You just have to just have to put a network between us. And there totally is a place for microservices for scaling because, as you just heard, uh, the PyPy people have also given up on uh, removing the gill. Or if you have heterogeneous environments, which is my problem, I have to interface with PHP and Perl. So what do you do? You write a microservice. Now, it is important to, to state, though, that complexity is your reality. And it's not the devil, but it is a price. It's a currency. It's something you pay to get things done. Now, uh, the thing is you have to be conscious about this, and you have to be conscious about your budget, because the budget depends entirely on you. It can be money for paying other people solving problems for you, or it can be uh, time. How much, how much time do I have to run, say, a Kubernetes cluster? Because the price can be really high, and Kubernetes is a very good example, because it's a super complex system. It's amazing. And case Kelsey Hightower just plays Tetris while deploying applications. But keeping it running is not that easy. There's uh, a lot of parts to it, like etcd, Flannel, Prometheus, Docker, and so on and so on. And you have to kind of master all of them to be able to solve problems when they arise, because they will. Now, if you can afford it, it's great. Just hire some people or pay someone to run it for you. But if you tech, use tech in prod uh, that you didn't master, just because it's cool or because you read on the Orange News website about it, Dante has some ideas about your near future. Now, speaking of stupidity, we should plan for it. And this is obviously a hyperbole because things only appear stupid in hindsight. But you may act stupid, every one of us, including me, especially me. So you can act stupid if you're sleep deprived because your baby uh, cried all night. You may be at a busy airport trying to deploy some hotfix that is really important that it gets out before you enter the plane. Or you are hustling really hard uh, to satisfy some well-meaning VC that has the best intentions for you. So I'm going to quote another smart person here, and it's John Allspur from Etsy, and he doesn't believe in human error, and neither do I. I believe that if a human causes an outage, it's usually because the system failed them. It's very, very rare that uh, things happen because out of malice or out of ignorance. So if you remember maybe the big S3 outage, I think it was in March or something, just half of the internet went down. Now, if you read the postmortem written by Amazon, which you should, it's very enlightening to read postmortems of uh, big companies, and you will see that they put no blame whatsoever on the humans involved. Someone used a CLI tool wrongly, so it was a human mistake. But this mistake shouldn't, ha shouldn't have been possible in the first place. So they fixed the tool and did not fire the, the person who did it. Now, what I'm trying to say is that when you're building tools or APIs, you should always assume that the operator is drugged from the dentist, consoling a crying baby, or is just sitting in a boring conference talk and is trying to get something done. And this is very similar to products for people with physical disabilities. Because it always turns out that ac accessible products made for them are usually even better, or not even, are better for, for people without any disabilities. And it's the same with software. And if it takes just like one click or one API call to lose all your data, someone will make that click or API call. I guarantee you. Maybe they will be just cleaning the phone and just accidentally press it. Uh, or there was this other story on Reddit um, where a junior de developer accidentally deleted all production data while setting up their test environment. Whose fault was this? I mean, if creating your test environment entails giving the production password to every single employee, and then they have to enter commands and replace things by hand, this is not a good workflow. This was a disaster to happen. 
and uh, they shouldn't have fired the person who made this mistake. They should have fired the person who put these measures in place, which is probably CTO, so it didn't happen, and as, as usual, it, uh, it hit the wrong one. Anyhow, if you add sharp edges, it's your fault if people hurt themselves or if people hurt your company. Now, um, part of that is uh, how you handle input. And it doesn't matter if it's malicious or by mistake, you have to be careful what you let in. And at this point, I fundamentally disagree with Postal's law, which is kind of says that you should be tolerant while receiving and conservative while sending. I think you should be always conservative. I think one of the reasons why almost everything is broken goes back to Postal's law, because we were way too tolerant to bad browsers, to bad mail servers, and so on and so on. This, by the way, was neither malicious nor a mistake. That was the only thing I liked about San Francisco. <laughs> now, take things like an invalid date string. I would compare it to a time bomb, because it wanders through a system, and the deeper it gets into a system, the more damage it can do. And the sooner you catch it, the, mean, the more meaningful can be your reaction to it. So, for example, Invalid date string. If the web view catches it, they can tell the user, hey, your date is wrong. If this date string reaches the ORM, it will probably just raise some integrity, er integrity error if you're lucky. If not, this will just eat it and something will break in five years. So you really need to validate your data at the edges. Other edges are your dunder init or command line parsing. Those just protect your borders, that's what I'm saying here. Now, I would take it further though. I think that validation is not enough. I think you should get your data into a simple canonical form that the rest of your system can rely on, because it will simplify your systems a lot. So why should your business logic know about JSON? Right? It should just get addicted. Or maybe if you do know the structure of the data, it shouldn't even be addicted, it should be a class. Because, like, rule of the thumb, if you do not iterate over the keys of a dictionary, it should be a class, not a dictionary. Which is also much better at catching typos and errors and, and that, uh, similar things. So, yeah. And also, I'm personally not a fan of passing around strings in general, like as making it part of your API. Because in, in the moment a function takes a string, it becomes a parser. And you can look at the CVE database, how parsers are uh, faring in the security context. I like, for example, enums. They're great for APIs. Now, I could keep talking and talking. However, I've established that complexity leads to normal accidents. Computers, turns out, are complex. Distributed systems are complex to the second. It follows that failure is inevitable. Eventually, something fails. Eventually, everything fails. All I told you before is about minimizing risks, but still failures are a part of your life. So in practice, your reliability is going to land on a spectrum. So somewhere between, um, say, Twitter in uh, 2007, which had an uptime of 98%, which means it was down for six days, and NASA in 1969, which landed on the moon, despite a human making an error on descent, but the system was robust enough to, um, to compensate for a human error. And this is what you want. The problem with NASA-style reliability is that you need an actual genius writing your software, right? A genius that will just invent software engineering while writing the moon landing code, which you can see there in its entirety. Now, <laughs> That means that you probably have to scale down your expectations, unless you have Ms. Hamilton on staff. In that case, I would like to apply for an internship. <laughs> so, all you can do, really, is minimize the risks. We've talked about that. You can prepare you for failure, and you can deal with it. <laughs> I'm proud of it. <laughs> so, this is your reality. And a great example on how to do this well, we've just seen just a few days ago, when this happened. Airbus 380 
uh, over the Atlantic and the engine fell apart. I think we can agree that it shouldn't happen, usually. But fortunately, Airbus engineers expected it to happen. And thanks to that, 500 people get to live. Because this, the whole airplane is anticipating problems like this. Which means, yeah. And this is how your system should really behave. Even if people are probably not going to die, I hope, if you, if you make a mistake. Problem isolation. Now, once you've embraced failure, um, how do you actively, actively expect it? Because you probably don't have to check for fires in your engine. So, but you need a system uh, on, which will make sure that your systems and your programs do what they are supposed to do. Because if you do not check it, for all you know, it's down. So you need monitoring that will give you the confidence that everything is okay. Now, um, so you have, need to t check for outages. You need to instrument your systems. And you need solid error reporting. Because silent failures are probably the worst thing ever. So um, I've talked about these things in the past two years. And uh, my taste didn't change. I still love Prometheus for metrics and monitoring. And I still love Sentry for, um, for uh, error reporting. Now, um, yeah, so both are open source. Sentry has also paid plans if you don't want to run it yourself. And it's great. And maybe I should add a disclaimer that David Kramer may or may not have a video of me singing Beyonce in a sketchy karaoke bar in Bilbao. <laughs> but I really like it. Now. Your code, you have to expect failure. So locally, this is actually easy. You get an exception, and you either catch it and handle it, or you don't, and it crashes. But it's a de deterministic outcome. Remotely, it's not that simple. Because if you get an instant error, you're actually lucky. Something like a connection refused, or a 500, that are the good failures. The worst failure scenario is that nothing happens, like nothing. And that means that whatever you do remotely, you have to put a timeout on it. And one missing timeout in a database driver was enough to take down a whole uh, airline in the United States. So it's really important. But what do you do if you run into a timeout? Do you just carry on as before? Because that, that would, uh, you would end up with a lot of slow and very useless requests, always just running to the timeout. And that's not a good user experience. It's bad enough that the user doesn't get what he wants or what they want. It also takes very long. And this is where the circuit breaker pattern comes into play. How many of you have heard of it? Oh, great, great, great. That's good. I'm not wasting my breath. So it's very simple. A circuit breaker acts like a local proxy between you and uh, your remote system. Let's say it's an API. So, and by proxy, I mean like a class. It's not a daemon. It's just something that wraps your calls to the remote API. And this is the normal state where it is closed. So it's called closed because it's like a drawbridge. And it just proxies the calls and the results back. Now, if you get failures, it doesn't have to be a timeout, but for example, a timeout. And if you get it once, you shouldn't probably do anything. But if you get it twice or thrice, you should do something. And in this case, the circuit breaker will change from closed to open. The drawbridge opens, and you get very, very fast responses, which just say, the API is down. Don't bother me. Now, after a certain time, it will send out a probe. So one lucky request from the user is sent out to the remote API to check where it's still broken. And if it succeeds, it goes back to closed, and everything is like before. If it fails, it stays open and keeps serving very fast errors. This is a very simple but very effective uh, concept for you. Now, I've said before, adding co more components is bad, because more things can uh, break. But if it's the same component, and if you hide this component behind a component that is, that is much more reliable than your components, like HA proxy, which I'm going to and I'm not saying it lightly, it's very good software, uh, it may actually improve. And there's like this general rule in the military which says that uh, two is one and one is none. And this is what you should probably follow in your own systems too, which also follows that you need at least three things of everything that is truly critical, because you will never want to be in a situation that you have only one. 
And this principle made the internet almost unbreakable, unless everyone's using the same DNS provider or everyone is using the same storage service in the same region. Well, we all lived through it. Now, and this works at any level, so network, you need more than one uplink, because it's, it's enough for one construction worker hit the wrong cable and you're offline. Server hardware, you should have more than one server. Data centers, ideally, you should have more than one. It depends on your business, uh, if that's realistic. realistic. And of course, backups. Because if this is all it takes to lose all your data, you do not have backups. And also, if you do not test your backups, you also do not have backups. And if you do not believe me, ask GitLab how it worked out for them. So, you want to be dispensable. So, it means that you must not be a knowledge silo. So, if people come regularly to you and ask you something, write it down. If there are regular tasks, like standard procedures that have to be done from time to time, write them down. And if there's something that needs to be done urgently in case of an emergency, exactly. Thinking that you will remember important things in a case of an emergency is, is a very dangerous fallacy because you won't. And one staple of aviation security is that pilots have a checklist for everything like for everything, including that the passenger had too much fiber for breakfast and now the toilet is clogged. I'm not joking, there is a checklist for clogged toilets, look it up. Now, once, uh, once you're in a state of outage or emergency, contingency plans are written out and up to date are priceless. And it doesn't have to be something technical or uh, because you can also write programs to do th certain things, but it can be communication. For example, you have to tell a social media team to stop telling your customers that everything is fine and they should check their modem. So, there's a lot of these things, and it's good to have them, believe me, been there. Now, finally, the dealing part. How do you deal with failure? How do you, what do you do when your database is gone, when your web service returns invalid data, when you're running into timeouts? So the first rule should be always, don't make things worse. Failure containment. Just because one engine is broken, you shouldn't just uh, set the whole plane alight. Because in the worst case, you get cascading failures, and then everything goes down. And instead of, yeah, so we've all seen it in practice, when just some, some little part of your system is down, and the overall system probably could just keep working, just like the plane. It's just, it just still had three engines, so there was really no danger in that case. But if you, if you don't take this into account, you can just take down everything. So, and in this context, let's talk about something very simple with very big impact, which is retries. Retries are obviously very essential in distributed systems because things fail. It just happens. Now, they are also one of the most dangerous concepts, because if you use them loosely, it can mean that you just uh, DOS yourself, or if you're doing it to a third party, it may just happen that they will blacklist you, and then you have some very uncomfortable phone calls ahead of you to get you off the blacklist. So, what you need is to back off with your retries. And now the question is, how long? Because if you run into a deployment, maybe one second is enough well, for the app to initialize itself. If the system is overloaded, maybe one minute is better because you're waiting for the Docker containers to come up. If a switch is broken in a DC, uh, well, it can take an hour until some poor schlop has uh, made, made it to the DC and switch hardware. But let's check every five minutes. That, that shouldn't um, be too bad. Now the question, the answer is you do all of it. You start with one second, or with a very short one, and just work yourself up into a very long thing. I usually use five minutes as the, as the uh, top, <clears throat> as the maximum uh, back off. Now, if all services do this at the same time, you still have a problem. Because if they retry at the same exact same moment, they can take a freshly provisioned system down with them again. And that's where the jitter comes in. And a jitter, it's just a 
short, uh, so just a ra random number that you add to your back of your computer, and it will space out your retries so they don't happen all in the same millisecond. Now, all of this is kind of intuitive, but again, there's a little bit more to it. So let's assume that you have the policy of three retries. And let's assume that the back end is your responsibility. And let's assume that you read the orange news page, which you shouldn't, and now you want to do microservices. All right. Now we are at three times three. So, so internal backend A is getting hammered with nine retries per one user interaction. And this isn't even close to microservices. So let's add one more layer and you're dosing yourself again. This is called a combinatorial retry explosion. And you're hitting C with three times three times three, which is 27 requests per one uh, request in the front end. So imagine if C was just like flaky because it was slightly overloaded. Now it's toast. There's nothing to be done anymore. And the simplest solution here is to just retry on top. So only the front end does the retries. This is what I usually do. But you have to know where your top is, which may not be as clear for everyone. So then you have to do more complicated things like per request retry budget and things like that. And this is another good example for a complexity you have through microservices or distributed systems that you wouldn't have before, have had before. Now, there's more to be said about things like back pressure, have it, unbounded queues, do not have them. It's mathematically bro uh, proven that an unbounded queue is worse than having no queue. So, I have no time, but there are links on the link page. So, next, you want to, uh, some insight into the failure. So, you don't want to swallow errors. You don't want to know what happened and why it happened. Because a silent failure is really the worst uh, failure, especially if it's backup scripts. Again, ask GitLab. So, and this is true in code too. So, and if you do something like this in a library, I have very strong opinions about you. Because how is anyone supposed to debug this? And this is something what I like to call a vanity exception, because you're using your own exception type to uh, report an error. But it's just as bad because the error details are still lost. Now Python has the solution to that. And it's called exception chaining. So this one will just uh, attach the original exception to your exception in a dunder cause. There's nothing special about it, really. It's just literally this syntactic sugar. And this is Python 3 code. Um, if you have to use Python 2, I feel, I feel bad for you. But there is a race from in 6, in the 6 library. So you're uh, covered, too. But really, if you do not know what to do with an exception, and this looks like you do not know what to do with it, just let it fly. Chances are that the user knows what to do with your exception. So the less you do, the less you can screw up. Speaking of that, this, the next one is a bit counterintuitive, I think. But if your app is unfit to do its work, for example, the database pool is broken, you could add a lot of complexity, like shutting it, down, uh, shutting it off to serve some kind of error and try to reconnect your pool. Or you add one line. And more often than not, this is just fine. This even runs your, or runs your add exits uh, handlers. And um, yeah, and this is called crash-only software. It's not something I've invented. Um, and there's a lot more nu nu nuance to it. There's like things like micro-reboots, which are sadly a bit hard in Python. But there's like solid science behind that. So to sum it up, fail fast, fail loudly. Nothing is worse. As, like a crash is better than a hang. As a user, I want a fast 500 over a hang of multiple minutes where I do not know what's uh, going on. Um, depending on the audience, a stack trace can be better than just saying there's an er er error that happened. Uh, you just have to be careful about secrets. And Redis took it to the next level. When Redis uh, crashes, it not only gives you a stack trace, it even runs a memory test for you and tells you if your RAM is broken, because it turns out that most of the crashes happen because of memory, of, uh, yeah, of broken memory. Now, once you've done all this, you need to focus on recovery. And this is where the MTTR reigns supreme, and that is the mean time to recovery. And if you've accepted that failures happen, because they do, 
and maybe you've even written crash-only software, it becomes much less important if something goes down, and it becomes much more important that it comes up, and that it comes up fast. And that's where uh, the humans um, cannot be allowed anymore. Your, your services have to be able to restore themselves. And if I pull a plug in your DC, your systems should be able to come up on themselves, because otherwise, if someone literally pulls the plug, and it happens to the power outages, um, you're going to have a very bad time trying to shepherd everything with up again. Now, the prerequisite for that is you, you must not have any expectations about things working while you're starting up. For example, database. You can try if it's up, but if it's not, write an error, retry later. So what I'm saying is that if, I, if, you, if you gave me a Docker container from you, from you and I ran it on my notebook, it should do something meaningful. It should just print errors and uh, do an exponential back off and try again, or just exit altogether if you uh, handle this outside. Now, um, what is the secret to a long, undisturbed vacation? Apparently, $9 Mai Tais in plastic cups. And other than that, build fault-tolerant systems that recover autonomously and throw your phone into the sea. And that's all what I have for you today. This is the promised link. The QR code will bring you there too. Follow me on Twitter. I also get dopamine hits like Flavio. And if you speak German, which is unlikely, but I still have to say it's bio domains from Vario Media because they pay me to get, get here. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, so what we're going to do now is take some questions. So if anyone has any questions? Raise your hand, please. Anyone? Oh, and feel free to come to and talk to me anytime, okay? I, I just want to know uh, why, why Musenberg? Why what? Why Musenberg? Oh, why Musenberg? Oh, it has the best waves, man. <laughs> so, true story, today I got up at 5.30 to get together with Flavio, and we went surfing for, at 6 a.m. <laughs> right, anything else? Anyone else? All right, so two in the back. Um, you want more eager? Uh, hi. Um, that server that was uh, set on fire. I mean, is that uh, is that re is that repeatable? I mean, you know. What? <laughs> it, is is that part of your test procedure? The actual like firing of servers? Oh, you mean like cows, monkey just with fire? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, it's it's. It's not a photo from our uh, emergency tests, no. <laughs> um, you mentioned um, multi-data center. Is there not a level of complexity that gets added? Um, I have dealt with people who have three data centers, and more often than not, their load balancing screws up when one data center goes down and takes everything down. And had they just spent the money on a nicer data center, the chances of the data center experiencing outages much, much lower than their hardware or software just scrapping out. Yes, that's why I s that was the one thing that I said with a disclaimer, it really depends. So for example, for us, we are a hosting company and we are required by certain um, uh, contracts with uh, uh, re re national registries to have two data centers and have uh, name servers in both. So that's what we do. And, but we do not have everything twice because we have a one very, very nice data center which is like military, secret, blah, blah. I once took a photo from the outside and almost got tasered for it. <laughs> and then it forced me to delete the photo. Uh, but we have a secondary, and the, the secondary DC is really just uh, for offsite backups. Again, if one server bring, uh, burns down, you should have still your data. And what we are forced to have there. But yeah, I completely agree. It's really hard to have uh, two DCs in a good way. Uh, you were talking about the circuit breaker um, principle. Yes. That could also get quite complicated, especially in micro, um, micro architecture. It, does everything go call through the circuit breaker, or does everything get its own circuit breaker call? Or so it, it, you know, everything gets its own. So everything has its own state, like uh, per component. And it really depends how you implement it. So uh, there, are, there are packages on PyPI that will do it for you. I personally do not use them. I usually do 
almost what, what it says, but slightly differently. But yeah, you, you do not have like one big circuit breaker that works for everything and has to keep track of connections and everything. No, it's just the, the one which just does one thing and it basically just catches exceptions, I think. Would you do it for like a core bit of your infrastructure or like little bits or would you do it for everything that times out? Yes, yeah. again, it's kind of uh, a trade-off, right? How much, how important it is for you uh, to have quick answers if something goes wrong? So I would certainly use it for user-facing things so the user gets a good experience of fast, um, fast replies. But then which systems are not ultimately user facing right so maybe a work queue or something doesn't doesn't matter but everything else yeah all right anyone else all right so oh, one. <laughs> sensible question now i hope um the retry budget uh that you mentioned i have nothing to say about that nothing to say about i just know it exists but i'm avoiding it because it's really complex because you have to keep the state somewhere which is another component for you you have to keep track of, so. Okay, cool, thanks. So I think it's explained in the Google SRE book. All right, anyone else? Oh, it's one bit. Uh, hi there, I was wondering, um, are you familiar with the, um, the Haxel set of libraries that um, it originated in Haskell and there's been some implementations for a couple of other programming languages? Um, uh, do you know about it at all? The what? The Haxel. Haxel. Um, Facebook made that. Uh, or think we what that does it do? Okay, basically it's, um, uh, I was thinking about it based on some of the things you said about like error reporting and memory dumping. Um, and what Haxel does is it's essentially an IO library that does a, um, several unique things, but among other things it has a global request pool and cache so that um, when an error happens, um, it can actually... Uh, dump the state of the entire request cache in such a way that um, you can reproduce um, everything, all the I.O. that happened up to the point of failure mm. um, after the fact or like, you know, in, in local debugging. Mm -hmm. um, so you can actually, um, it's almost like taking a snapshot of the entire state and history of the I.O. that happened on the server, mm -hmm. not just the memory or the, the current state, everything that led up to it in a way that you can then kind of like ship somewhere else as part of your um, crash report. Yeah, okay, so, um, so it's like a frozen state of an history, basically. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Does it have overhead? It sounds expensive. Uh, well, they, they, they found a way to make it like... Um, it, it actually gets more efficient, I think, because you, it ends up acting as a global cache. Hmm. So th there's a bunch of um, things that, go in, that goes into it, but I was wondering if you um, yeah, just knew about it or had any thoughts on no. that. No, no, sorry. Um, okay, because like, that's something that would be really cool to see in Python. All right, anyone else? Okay, so just go back so I can see. All right, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so I'm going to make two uh, small announcements. Um, if you're a speaker, I don't know how many people are actually here are speakers, um, there's going to be a 5 p.m. Five p.m. in a tea room. There's going to be some sh shirts handed out, also for organizers, I think. I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, the thing for an announcement for everyone else is that after the lightning talks at 5 p.m. as well, um, in the Congo room, if uh, we, we're looking for volunteers for the video team, uh, so there'll be 15 minutes of training right after the lightning talks, um, which uh, will help out a bit. You could be just basically sitting next to the uh, video person, uh, like like over there, and uh, helping out. And uh, yeah, so that'll be also appreciated. And I think that's it. Um, thanks again, um, Hinnick. And uh, of course. Okay.